Hello viewers, this is Shantanu Mukherjee, advisor Nat Strat, welcoming you all for our fifth episode of the conversation series. And today we are fortunate to have Swasini Heather with us, a well-known face, very familiar to all of you. She's the diplomatic editor of The Hindu, as well as a well-known analyst on current affairs. For the first one hour, Suhasini, we'll discuss about the happenings in Afghanistan. And then, for the next half, we'll discuss about the external relations of Afghanistan, whatever is happening. So, to begin with, while welcoming you to Natstrat, on August 15, we'll be completing two years of the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. So, how do you see Afghanistan moving along after that? Uh, thanks so much for having me on this uh, very prestigious show because we've been following a lot of the regional coverage, particularly that Natstrat has done. Uh, and it always does feel a little humbling that you are sitting in the questioning seat. Normally, I would be questioning you. Um, but I think, you know, to begin with, what happened on August 15, 2021? showed everybody that things can change very suddenly and very dramatically in our region, uh, a country that is not too far from India. In fact, if you look at our stated boundaries, Afghanistan borders us, uh, that something so big could happen that the Taliban could take over the way it did without any kind of resistance certainly seemed like a, a point at which we in India needed to think a little bit take a step back and see where we got our, maybe our calculations a little off, uh, uh, off key. Uh, why does Afghanistan matter to us? There's ancient history. There's uh, hundreds of years of history between us. There's also a more recent history, which is very positive. If you don't count the five years uh, preceding that, from 96 to 2001, when the Taliban was last in power, uh, for two decades, India was Afghanistan's really its most popular neighbor. India was the country Afghanistan signed its first strategic partnership with. India was the country that did the donations of $2 billion. Uh, India was the country that thought up ambitiously at a time when Afghanistan had so much violence. India thought up ambitiously to build a parliament, to build uh, the Zaranj Delaram Highway, to build uh, the, the hospitals, the dams, and all the other infrastructure projects. Um, and in terms of strategically, uh, too, India had a huge stake in what happens in Afghanistan. So from one point of view, it was to ensure that Pakistan did not get a foothold in a country um, where it could then have plausible deniability from uh, some of the terror groups that were operating there. Uh, the second part, of course, is India's connection with Central Asia, its connection with Iran has for the last few years been stopped by Pakistan. You know, the trans, transit trade is not allowed. And these all now become ways for India to circumvent Pakistan because we are not able to diplomatically resolve our issues with Pakistan. Um, so for all these reasons, it is impossible for an Indian to say, you know, lock up Afghanistan and throw away the key and let's mm -hmm. not be involved in it. So maybe on August 15th, even though we had to, from a security point of view, take that decision to pull out everyone, uh, from the embassy there, uh, I think in time it became very clear that India cannot just leave Afghanistan uh, to the rest of the world. Uh, and India is, uh, is in a position in Afghanistan where people look up to India for support and for help. Uh, so when you say, where are we now two years later? I think the first part is that there is an understanding within the government and I think for Indians that Afghanistan cannot be wished away, and it is certainly a country that we need to be engaged with. Um, when it comes to the internal situation of Afghanistan, of course, there aren't too many good uh, stories to tell. And, right. you know, everybody yeah, reads the newspaper, coming, yeah. holds their head, uh, hand, right. uh, head in their hands when they see some of the headlines coming out. But... No, other than this is, what worries me, maybe that because of my exposure to security and my uh, earlier profession, security and intelligence. The spate of Swasini, the terror attacks, absolutely remains unabated. I mean, 
do you find that this trend is going to be contained, uh, whether by Indian efforts or the global efforts or Afghanistan Taliban itself, or it is going to increase further? That is very worrisome, not only in India, but the Afghanistan, because you just said about the uh, age-old historical ties between India and Afghanistan. It may not be directly affecting us, but as a well-wisher of Afghanistan and the Afghan people, we feel worried about it. So how do you read the terror scene there? Well, you know, to be honest, one has to go by what, say, the UNAMA puts out as its reports of what is happening on the ground. And certainly there is a security situation of concern. Uh, some would say cynically that actually since the Taliban took over in the last two years, uh, and since you more or less gave the uh, group that was formerly seen as a terror group the keys to the kingdom, that actually there's been relative stability in Afghanistan that so far the challenge is not to the Taliban in Kabul. Um, there are other groups that are operating and, and, those, and, yeah. those, and yeah. those will always be of uh, worry. There's uh, ISK, the Islamic State Khorasan, yes. um, which still uh, you know, works in a very, very amorphous way. Yes. Nobody's quite sure. They're not connected necessarily to Al ISIS. Al-Qaeda. And Al-Qaeda. The remnants of those who were there 20 years ago, you know. Uh, and then there is the TTP. Now, that's been more in the news yeah. in the last few um, weeks because of yeah. the kind of uh, 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 statements coming out of the Pakistani army and a uh, meeting chaired by General Asim Munir there saying that the, uh, Afghanistan has now got safe havens uh, and sanctuaries for the TTP terror group. This is very interesting for us in India to watch because normally when we complained about these safe havens for terror groups in Pakistan, we did not get any kind of uh, positive response from Pakistan. But today, Pakistan is feeling the heat of that. Some of it is also because within the Taliban, there will be differences. After all, the Taliban is not one a uh, single group, we know that there are the Haqqanis in there, there are the Kandahari Taliban, there are other members of the ta uh, Taliban, and then there are some that were in the old days at least seen as the moderate Taliban, if you like. I put it in quotes because, frankly, ideologically, there's no moderate uh, within them. It can only be relatively moderate. But the, the leaders of the Taliban that India was able to speak to, other people were able to speak to, based in Doha, uh, who had given certain assurances for what not just the security situation, but the social situation in Afghanistan would be. When there are differences within the Taliban itself, um, there is always the potential for some more uh, violence as well. Uh, and the last part I would say is that if the Taliban did not survive for the, after, you know, from 96 to 2001, and then they, did, they were not in power, of course, in that situation, 9-11 came in between. And the government that followed didn't last more than 20 years, uh, then is it a guarantee that the Taliban as we see it today will continue to remain in power in Kabul? I think these are all questions that we have to ask. Yeah, it's a very convincing argument you put forward. But tell me something which sort of uh, defies my uh, comprehension of the subject of this terror-related thing. Is this that Taliban itself was allied with terror and labeled as a terror group? How is this a handful of uh, Al-Qaeda remnants and the affiliates as well as uh, the TTP or ISKP, they are unable to control? I, you said very rightly that there are fragments, there are, there are differences between them, some may be aligned to them. And why that soon after the born homie with Pakistan, I'll discuss with you in the second part, all right, with Pakistan, suddenly died and we find that uh, they, uh, this uh, TTP, uh, this offensive operations that doubled and trebled and they, they started. What is the reason that the failure of Taliban is unable to control Al-Qaeda, ISKP and to some extent TTP? That's my question. I think the question has to be asked of two parts. One is capability, the other is intent. Uh, is the Tali, does the Taliban see its role as actually needing to shut down these groups or simply ensure that they are not able to bring more problems for them? In, a, in, in the sense, does, does the Taliban actually think terrorism is evil? 
Does the Taliban actually think that each of these groups should be completely finished? Or is the Taliban essentially working it as a holding operation? These are people they have been brothers in arms with at one point. Um, and and uh, groups that they would rather just have around, but not necessarily allow them to destabilize them in any way. I think that's a little bit of what you're seeing with the TTP. Uh, that is the Taliban actually taking action against the TTP? There's no real verifiable information on that. Uh, are they allowing them to have safe havens across what has always been a slightly difficult uh, uh, border or, or Duran line, however you want to see it? Um, that, again, is, is there is no evidence to show that the Taliban is trying to push them back in or hand them over. Um, and in a sense, there are those also within Pakistan's army that may feel that's, in two different ways uh, about the TTP as well. Uh, oh yeah, so I think yeah. you're, you're looking at a situation where, um, honestly, we're not seeing any of the other countries today having a kind of role in trying to destabilize um, the, the government in Kabul. And after all, India too has taken a position on not supporting any of the opposition groups, even the armed opposition groups of uh, Emma Shah Massoud's uh, junior, his son who is now in charge, does not get any support from India. So at a time when other countries are saying publicly that we do not want to be a part of it, what we are actually seeing is it playing out between Kabul and Rawalpindi in a certain sense, also between Kabul and Kandahar. Um, and uh, possibly, as you said, the remnants of Al-Qaeda and ISK as well. So why has this come up again? Because eventually, when you don't have a system of government, when you have non-state actors, then you have a tolerance for non-state actors That's who are armed. That is going to hurt everybody who seeks stability or who seeks, seeks to be in a position of power. Yeah, like you updated us, and I also saw in the press that very recently, General Asif Mani, the chief of the army staff of Pakistan, during the core commanders conference, had said that it is the TTP they need to be reined in. But at the same time, a day before, Zaidullah Mujahid, the spokesperson for the Taliban, has completely denied uh, about the TTP presence on the Afghan soil. And he even dared the Pakistani authorities to come out with evidence if they want that is the, So we'll take action. So I think this is not going to die, this war of words at all. And But the only thing is people will suffer, isn't it, this terror? Well, uh, certainly, and what Zabiullah Mujahid says about the TTP, we've heard for years from Pakistan, talking about, um, uh, you know, groups. And we say the lashkar e the Jaish Muhammad has a camp there. I think at some level, yes, we can uh, indulge in a bit of schadenfreude about what Pakistan is facing. But beyond that, we have to understand, as you said, A, that it is civilians who are feeling the brunt of the kind of terror attacks we're seeing along the uh, line between them. But B, that any group that becomes, uh, that gets a safe haven in a country and is allowed to um, grow over there can also open the door for other groups. After all, there have been enough reports that lashkar e toiba and jaish e Mohammed, at least in the southern states in Afghanistan, did have a presence, Very did have, have, have camps as well. Uh, and that is something that India must always keep that's an eye on. a very on. significant point you are making. That's, that's wonderful. You're taking note of it. Anyway, please carry on. So uh, the, the point being that what we are seeing is the normal frictions that are playing out with the situation where there are uh, uh, non-state actors in play. Now, apart from this, there is there are very real questions that we have all kicked down the road, you know, it's like kicking a can down the road. After all, two years later, the Taliban does not have recognition as a state. No country, unlike 1996, when Pakistan, the UAE, Saudi Arabia were willing to recognize the Taliban regime in Kabul. At this point, no country is willing to give them uh, a recognition. The United Nations has refused to recognize their uh, official as their um, as the ambassador either. You're looking at an inherently unstable process as a result. I'm not for a moment saying that there should be recognition. I'm just saying that if for two years a government has been in Kabul uh, more or less in the face of a lack of recognition, that means that at some point there must be a decision. Can they be allowed to continue like this? Because after all, they came to power 
on the backs of this of, um, of many promises right. contained in what was called the Doha Agreement. Right. You know, they promised that they would look towards an inclusive government. They promised that they would look towards a plurilateral uh, sort of a, uh, regime over there. They promised that they would uh, not ban girls from school or women from work. Uh, and they promised that they would not allow safe havens for uh, um, for any um, uh, terror, groups, terror groups, an international terror in particular, because the real worry for the rest of the world has always been the export of terror, the export of drugs, and uh, uh, the export of radicalization from Afghanistan. Um, so they have more or less not kept any of these promises. The question is, how long is the world going to allow it, and how much rope the world will give them at this time? Uh, what we also see in uh, uh, Afghanistan at present is uh, a, a, a dire situation for minorities. Um, even even mm. though at one point the Taliban tried to bring in one of the uh, groups, uh, uh, one of the governors of a state uh, as a Hazara, a Shia, yeah, Malvi cleric, that, yeah. um, uh, that didn't last too long. So we are not seeing any backtracking on the ideological uh, strictness of the Taliban in a sense. Instead of allowing girls into school, they are now finding more and more excuses to put off the date when girls will be allowed to go to school. When Instead of uh, allowing women to work, they're cutting down the areas where women can work. Now even beauty salons are not uh, 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 being permissible. I think they've given them a one month deadline. So what we're looking all around is at a, a, a state which is being run by non-state actors. And the question is really how long can the world allow its, what I can only call its fatigue with the war in Afghanistan, to um, make them turn a blind eye to what is going on inside Afghanistan. So what we are seeing is an inherently unstable situation. So when you talk about the TTP or any of these groups that are there, why are we worried? Because as one expert said to me, it feels like Afghanistan is a grenade. And someone has already pulled the pin out. We just don't know when it will when explode. It will explode. Like you, we are talking about security and I'm so happy you're so well informed and in one of our informal chats before this show when we were discussing about radicalization in the region and in Afghanistan. So if we could hear about your thoughts on to what extent the society in Taliban stands radicalized or it is, it is not, I mean, completely indoctrinated on the basis of religious extremism that it is and now following a, a very regressive policy and it is getting endorsed by the society. You know, so we, we're taught very much in terms of black and white that Afghanistan is a conservative society and this is their traditional uh, um, sort of uh, practices and that the Taliban simply brought those back. But the question is that for the last 20 years, Afghan girls went to school, uh, Afghan women went to work. Is it possible to say that all those girls who went to school and all those women who went to work and the families they belonged to that benefited from the fact that women were able to bring in an income or hospitals where women were doctors and even pilots right. at so one sad. point. Is it possible to say that all of Afghan society remained traditional while all of these changes were happening, where the young men of Afghanistan did not grow up with a gun in their hand and instead came to countries like India, studied medicine, studied, uh, got their MBAs uh, and went back? I think this, there is no question that this might be a political ideology of the Taliban, but in no way is it the tradition of Afghanistan uh, to not allow equality in its society. So I think the first thing that has to be done is to separate what we know historically as uh, as Afga uh, Afghan culture. Uh, progressive. And uh, uh, frankly, what the Taliban wishes to uh, impose on, on its society. After all, the Taliban has reimposed very strict versions of the face covering. Uh, they're no longer just saying that you have to cover your head or whatever. It's, a, it's, it's practically a full chadar of, of the past. Um, the, the second part to this is really that if you are going to keep an entire generation of girls, and by logic, we know when you, when you educate a girl, you educate a family. When you keep a girl away from education, possibly that entire family then will suffer. Her future family will suffer. Yeah. So you will, when you keep an entire generation away from education in this way, where are they going to turn? Particularly as malnourishment grows, as you know, they've had a drought, they've had an earthquake, uh, they, they deal with famine. 
where is all of this going to go? It may unfortunately head back into a situation where you recreate uh, this uh, radicalization as, as Afghan culture. But I don't for a minute think that any country in the world, let alone Afghanistan, deserves to just live in one single uh, sort of ideology. The other part of it which nobody talks about right now is what about the minorities in Afghanistan? You know, all the groups that have yeah. remained over there um, and, and don't have another place to go. The third part is how this will affect countries around Afghanistan. Region, because region. it is not possible to contain the Afghan problem just within Afghanistan. History has shown us again and again, whether it was in the British times, whether it has been uh, in the recent century, that when there is a problem inside Afghanistan, the rest of the world does hear about it. Central Asian countries are very worried about radicalization growing in their societies. Um, the one place where the Taliban says it has a success, apart from this idea of regional stability, um, the other place is on drugs, where the Taliban has taken credit for the fact that they have slashed poppy cultivation, that they have slashed drug exports. But eventually, if a society, as I said, you come back to this unstable idea that is being is ruling Afghanistan today, if that society is not able to grow, if they are not able to build an economy, you will have people turning back to whether it is the gun or whether it is drugs or whether it is radicalization, you will have them turning back to all of these. So the question will not be, has, 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 uh, is Afghan society conservative, but has the Taliban kind of reimposed some of the, uh, you know, the, the, the problematic behavior of the past on a society that had actually learned to live a different life? Well, like, uh, I wanted to go back to what you said a few minutes ago. Like, for example, uh, they are desperate about getting recognized, the Taliban regime, and many are not coming forward, as you know. Now, considering that, it's a hypothetical question, but we are taking the conversation ahead because of your knowledge, I want to bank on you. That if there is a precondition that you have to withdraw these impositions like full face covering or not running the hair cutting saloons, <coughs> excuse me, etc., etc., then will that work? So, kind of mild pressure, or the Taliban is that rigid that it will not relent? and these uh, rigorous measures will continue your take i mean frankly. interesting because obviously we know that if no one else in the region the western countries have certainly made a lot of uh, things whether it's aid whether it's support in some way whether it's some kind of recognition very contingent on what the taliban is willing to do uh, when it comes to girls education or women's um, uh, employment and yet the taliban has not relented one of the reasons for for that is they say that um, uh, the Emir in Kandahar does not agree with other Taliban factions that do believe in a more progressive, uh, it's all relative as I said, but a more uh, progressive outlook towards women. The second problem over here is that the Taliban has learned that this is a bargaining chip. Mm -hmm. So when they want to extract something from the Western world, they, they impose more um, regulations and then perhaps show some leniency in them. I'll give you an example. They made it clear about six months ago that no women can work in UN agencies even. And, and you know, the UN uh, yeah, was paralyzed. That, yeah. um, at, at that time, they were trying to get certain concessions out of the international community. And they got them? Yes. And over time, you have seen a certain leniency in uh, the Norwegian uh, um, uh, aid agency, for example. The women who work there have been able to come back. Some of the UN agencies are again working with women because women are crucial to their operations. How do you uh, ensure that you get your uh, aid across to women of a village? You can't do it with men. So it, it, women have to be there. So they have learned that this is a bargaining chip in a certain way. You spoke about recognition, and this is really a very crucial point because much as the, uh, 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 much as the Taliban wishes for recognition, um, the fact is that they have found back roots in to the recognition question. So the, the idea is that even though nobody recognizes the Taliban as the, uh, the rulers of uh, Afghanistan, they do have as many as 15 or 16 uh, countries now have missions in Kabul. Yes. India included. India has a technical, technical mission there. Nobody calls it an embassy. But you all have missions in Kabul. 
um, many of those countries like Pakistan, uh, Russia, China, some of the Central Asian countries have now accepted Taliban nominees in the embassies in their countries. Um, so in Moscow, in Beijing, in Islamabad, there are actually Taliban appointees. You may have followed in the last few months in Delhi, there was this real uh, tussle within the uh, Afghan embassy in Delhi. Um, and we don't know if it's completely played out, uh, but the real worry that uh, not just a Taliban appointee could take over the embassy, but what would be the next step? Would there be a Taliban flag down Shantipat? Uh, those those are uh, important questions. Uh, and the third part of this recognition that they've been able to do is engagement. So Taliban appointed ministers now travel to various countries, uh, particularly Central Asia and Moscow. And uh, they have been able to receive ministerial delegations as well from Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, from Pakistan, and all the rest. Pakistan, of course, famously sent its minister yeah, of state, Hina Ravani Khardar. Um, so these three things the Taliban has been able to do. Uh, and it is trying to figure out a way to continue to rule their country without necessarily getting the recognition. That's true. So it's very enlightening uh, to know a lot of things happening. and and. And thank you so much because you have been very prescriptive also. We could get that if this could be done. And because of long years of reporting on Afghanistan or dealing with it, sort of, we, are, we, we know we have a perspective now what is happening to security, radicalization, and what to do. And you very rightly said that they have learned the ropes of, you know, doing the bargain and to get their pound of flesh wherever it is necessary. That's really very good. Anyway, thanks a lot for the first half. And viewers, uh, uh, here it comes to an end, the first part of our conversation with uh, Swasani Heather. We'll resume our conversation in the second part, that is external relations on Afghanistan, what is happening in the region, then after a while. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Swasani. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me at Natstra.